We're good to go. All right, we're going to call this meeting of the Housing Authority of the County of Monterey Board of Commissioners to order at 4.33 p.m. Uh, we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's do a uh, roll call, please. Okay. Chair Hamas Buda. Present. Vice Chair Kathleen Bellasaro. Present. Commissioner Kevin Healy. Commissioner present. Okay. Commissioner Francine Goodwin. Uh, present. Commissioner Maria Orozco is absent. Commissioner Yuri Anderson is absent, but will be making an appearance. Okay. okay, we're going to move on to item three, um, comments from the public. Um, Gabby, do we have any from, from, from the public uh, here in person today? Uh, we have nobody in person. Anybody online have a public comment? Yes, I do. This is John Rose speaking. Okay, you have three minutes. Thank you very much. Good evening, commissioners. This will be brief. I shall not excessively elaborate on Hackham's continuing continuing non-responsiveness to Michi's FOI request that I mentioned during your November board meeting. However, just know that Hackham's silence on a myriad of other issues involving Michi includes its conspicuous silence on this FOI request. The board should seriously think about the consequences of their guidance to Hackham staff on this matter. It's got consequences. Have a good evening and a pleasant holiday. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, is there anyone wishes to speak tonight? Okay. We're gonna move on to item number four, the consent agenda. Okay, I do have one uh, request before you do the agenda. Can we table um, under new business item B, resolution 3098 for the new payment standards? Yep. Okay, do we need a, a motion? Yeah, I, I make a motion to table resolution 3098 for tonight. Can we get a second? Yeah. I'll make a second and motion. Okay. All right, the uh, motion has been moved and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. Okay. Chair Hans Buter? Yes. Vice Chair Kathleen Bellasaro? Yes. Commissioner Kevin Healy? Yes. Commissioner Francine Goodwin? Yes. And that concludes the roll call vote. Okay, um, we're gonna move on to item four, which is uh, the consent agenda. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda, or would anyone like to amend the consent agenda? Move we'll approval. Okay. I'll second. We're going to say it's moved by Commissioner Healy and seconded by Commissioner Ballesteros. Okay. Um, Chair Hans Buter? Yes. Vice Chair Kathleen Ballesteros? Yes. Commissioner Kevin Healy? Yes. Commissioner Francine Goodwin? Yes. And that concludes the vote. Okay, um, we're going to move on to item five, reports of committees. Um, my understanding is that we didn't have committee meetings this month, um, so we're going to pass on that one for this month, and we are going to, I guess the only thing I would say on that is, um, you know, commissioners at our board retreat, one of the things that we're going to look at is um, creating some new committees that I think are maybe more functional than what we've had, um, which I think will be helpful for us. Uh, so we'll move on from item five to item six, which is um, Zalika's report. Okay. Um, just a few highlights. The informational update on the FLCs, we're working with the USDA to get that budget approved. We're trying to finalize a rent 
um, that is somewhat lower than the rent that we submitted, but still substantial enough to be able to support the property's repairs and not put a unnecessary burden on the tenants that's there. So that's in the works. We hope to have it concluded within the next two weeks because uh, we're already behind on implementing the changes. Uh, we have been PDB technical assistance here on site this week. It's the final part of the HUD TA for the PD violation that the agency received last year. So it'll be focusing on what the Section 8 part of it is, how the AHAP contracts go, and then we're going to do a refresher for the development team. Uh, the city has passed a resolution on December the 5th to award us the housing stabilization funds. We are waiting for the final uh, award notification. I don't know if it's going to be 331 because I did see one paper where they had like 286,000, but we'll know for sure when we get the final award, but the resolution has passed. On the development, we recently terminated the property management contract with John Stewart for Rippling River. We plan to take over management as of February the 1st, which will give us a 60-day transition period. And they're working with us on that very closely. They're being very helpful. So we anticipate that to be a smooth transition. Uh, the HCB department, the EHB voucher program, which ends this at the end of this month, we reached our goal of 265 uh, housed individuals and families. The mainstream program, which we had a goal of 59, we've housed our 59. And then for the family unification program, we have 42. We only have one voucher left, and we'll be at 100%. And we're working very hard this month to try to get that one voucher. And other than that, um, a little bit about FSS, which after this meeting, the FSS will be included in the HCB board report. It's just that they was reporting to me while we were going through the changes. So we had uh, five graduates. We have 99 participants. Of the 99, 38 are escrowing. Uh, they did presentations at 15 local agencies, which has helped us with our outreach. And they have a goal to try to work towards increasing Section 8 home ownership uh, for the next year. And we've already been awarded a grant for next year from HUD, so we don't have to worry about any funding. Uh, we should be able to release it as of January because this grant officially stops at the end of December. It was a slight increase. So that's really good for us, and we'll be able to move forward with the program. And that's the end of my report. Everything else is in the board memos. Uh, do any commissioners have questions for Zalika on her report? Zalika, what's on the FSS program? What's the average that the people that graduate, what do they tend to walk away with from the administration? Well, up here it's a little different. So it's, I would say about Twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars because they're in the program five years, mm -hmm. and so as the rent increase, part of it go to the escrow, yeah. and so that's how they accumulated so much. But they do have to have tangible goals yeah. before they receive the funds yeah. and meet our criteria. And then the home ownership piece it seems like it's a tall order out here. Well, no, you know I got a couple ideas about that. Though I want to run by you at, in the board at the retreat uh -huh. for the Section Eight participants because I think I see a way how we can kind of make it work. It's exciting. I'd be interested to hear about that. Um, other questions for um, Zalika on her report? <clears throat> I have some other questions, but I think they're probably better suited for the individual Memo. reports. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Well, we're going to move on then to item seven, which is new business. And we are going to start with item 7A, resolution 3097, adoption of disability accommodation policy by the Board of Commissioners of the Housing Authority of the County of Monterey. Yeah, this is a, a policy that is being recommended in connection with some um, findings that we previously had, previously had with the EEOC. We have a policy, but this merely strengthens the one that we have. And then it's very transparent to keep out any confusion for when an employee actually needs a reasonable accommodation. The reasonable accommodations that go from the employee, they have to give them writing to human resources. Human resources that have a meeting with them, if it's a disability that's not readily visible, they will ask for medical information. 
And then they'll submit the recommendation after they have also talked to the director of that program, to the executive director or whoever the designee is. And then the uh, person will come back, they will let them know what it is, you know, what's been decided, how we're going to move forward. So the staff person can make a suggestion as to how to deal with the recommendation, but we do not have to accept the recommendation. It depends on if it's going to cause an undue burden or be unfair in some other ways to other staff members, but we do offer an alternative accommodation that works for us. And so I think it's really transparent, it's really clear. Uh, some of the issues we had in the past, I think, is address all of them so that there's a better flow for if this was to come up. And I think on um, on these new business items, um, we're supposed to offer public comment. So um, the public comment has to relate to the specific item under discussion. Um, so are there any public comments relating to item 7A before we take commissioner comments? Okay, um, hearing none, uh, we are going to um, take commissioner comments. Any comments or questions? from commissioners on item 7A? I did have a question um, just about the actual content. Is this sort of a form policy that, you know, is, that we got from, you know, uh, oh, wow. an umbrella organization or, or other housing authorities, or did we go to an attorney for this? Just how you're- uh, No, it was created with the ADA assistance okay. to make sure that we get all the criteria. Okay. When you say with the ADA's assistance, what do you mean by that? Well, let me let James go into more detail, but yeah. we did get assistance to make sure we wanted to- Yeah, we, can, we did advise our legal counsel in regards to the verbiage that's on the policy itself, okay. to make sure it's, it ties in with the ADA and the FEHA and all that. Um, kind of labor laws that comply with it, just to kind of be more kind of transparent with our applicants that apply and then our current uh, employees here. So we ran it by council. Yeah, so, yes. And so the right. union too. Yes, and the union. The union and I do have a meeting to do an impact meeting on it just to kind of open up that form for okay. dialogue, which is this one, just runs to have a review of it if it goes through. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I did, unless there are other comments, um, uh, I would entertain a motion on item 7A. I'll make a motion. motion. I'm sorry, I'll make a motion. Okay. Is there a second? Francine, I think you're muted, but I was reading your lips. <laughs> I didn't realize I was muted. I, I do that because things happen over here that I. I don't want you guys to have to hear. <laughs> Understandable. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, I second it. Okay. It's been um, moved by Commissioner Ballesteros, seconded by Commissioner Goodwin. Uh, roll call, please. Uh, Chair Hans Buder. Yes. Vice Chair Kathleen Melisaros. Yes. Commissioner Healy. Yes. And Commissioner Francine Goodwin. Yes. That concludes the roll call vote. Okay. Just as a reminder, we tabled item 7B uh, for tonight, and we're moving on to item 7C, resolution 3099, resolution for the conversion of emergency housing vouchers to housing choice vouchers. Uh, speak up. Okay, for our EHV program, we've really been pushing it very hard this year, and so we I'm not going to say we overbreached the program. The <laughs> <laughs> well, once we kind of enlightened the landlords and the tenants, more it was more success for the routers. Yeah. So we did uh, make our 265, but we actually probably going to be over by 107. And so uh, with the rules and the regulations on the EHB program, we cannot take those vouchers in as EHB. So normally what we would have to do is tell those people that unfortunately their voucher issuance would have to be rescinded and we wouldn't be able to help them or place them on the bottom of the regular HCV waiting list. However, our uh, current HCV program is underutilized. And with that being said, that does create an opportunity for us to potentially house the 107 people that are out there remaining but convert the EHB to a regular HCV. 
and let them be able to buy housing within the county. Uh, it's just a policy policy change for the admin, and it's only for the 107 people that are out there now. So no new EHBs will be issued if these 107 people, if their raptors expire, we won't be able to grant any extensions, anything of that nature. So it's strictly for the 107 that are outstanding. And really with the attrition rate that we have here, we probably end up with 80 of them at the most. And so the other spaces, if this policy is approved, would just uh, be taken away and we would only do those 80. Then we have two other options. Um, you can put in an application for HUD to try to amend your CACC contract, the number of EHBs that they gave you. But with our performance not being at its best at the beginning, that's not guaranteed that they'll amend it that high. And so we can try it. If it does work, if they give us additional vouchers, we'll use those for the 107 and then just take away from the total. Also, HUD just put out a list of all the uh, housing authorities that have EHB vouchers up for recapture. We were not on the list. They said they're going to redistribute them in the same state they was issued out. So California as a whole has 100 and... <laughs> have 161 vouchers. So we guarantee to at least get five of those, but the rest of the distribution will just be based on whatever algorithm that uh, HUD uses. So if we get any, and some of the 107 are still out, we'll use the EHB additional award for that and just reduce it. But hopefully uh, what I'm wanting us to do is go ahead and do this policy so that we don't have, leave these people at risk of being homeless. And then uh, it also help our utilization. It is not a funding issue. So it's just a matter of do we want to adopt the policy? But again, it's not for any other vouchers, not for any other participants, only the 107 that are outstanding right now. Okay. Um, uh... Is there any public comment specifically relating to resolution 3099? Okay, hearing none, we're going to move on to comments and questions from commissioners. Uh, throw it open to all of you. Any questions for Zalika on this? Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. Um, one was maybe a different version of attrition, but when somebody loses their voucher uh, uh, or they, um, you know, income off of the voucher, however they lose the voucher, do these, are these 107 slots temporary? In other words, do they eventually just go back out to the normal voucher pool oh, at that point? No, because these are EHB vouchers. So, so it's like a permanent yeah, reclassification? Is, mm -hmm. That is permanent. The only way we'll change it if we get an additional EHB award, then we can take it and convert them back over to EHB, which will release a regular HCV for another family. But if we don't get any additional EHB, this is a permanent transfer for the young to a regular HCV voucher. Is there any way to structure in the resolution so that um, when these specific 107 people lose their voucher that it goes back into the normal pool that it to be. You can't because of the latest PIH notice they did on EHB. Mm -hmm. You can't do any new vouchers after September the 30th. That's why at first we had 269, but they reduced us down to four because of you know our past performance. Mm -hmm. uh, so they made our allocation 265. So once you lose an EHB voucher, it's just gone. Oh, well, that's classified. I guess that's my question. It's like if we if we want to stick with two hundred sixty five mm -hmm. and make an exception for these yeah, these specific families, mm -hmm. is there some structure, some mechanism through which we can say the exception applies to these specific hundred and seven families, as opposed to in perpetuity, we're creating one hundred seven. Oh no, it's that's how it is. Yeah, it's just these hundred and seven. It's another addition that'll be on here with the actual names of those persons. Yeah. But since all our stuff is public, we can't put that, mm -hmm. you know, on the board meeting. But it'll be with the policy. So it's only those hundred and seven people. And at the at the risk of just like you know, beating a dead horse, like if if one of those hundred and seven folks 
you know, their income for six months is over the mm -hmm. voucher limits and they lose their voucher it's for whatever up. reason. Eventually, the total number of EHVs drops from 265 plus 107 to 265 plus 106. That... Well, the EHV is just going to say at 265 because we can't claim any more EHVs other than 265. Okay. So if we change these 107 to a regular HCB, let's say we got 3,000 regular HCB. Then we say, okay, we're going to do this with 107. So we got 3107. And one of them drop off, then that's 3106, 3105, like that. They do not get replaced. So but when it gets reissued, it's it's not an it's not an EHV. And, the, and the, when that voucher gets reissued, it goes through the normal yeah, it goes through the normal process. process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the only way to stay an EHV and be able to be renewed is if HUD give us some new EHV vouchers. Yeah. Which we should get at least five. Uh -huh. But I can't say it over there if you get in it. But no, this is specific to these families. Yeah. These are vouchers just for them. So as they come off the program for whatever reason, that voucher just goes away. And then remind us all, like I was under the impression, uh, and it may be unique to some of the housing clerks I work with in Texas, that EHVs had higher subsidies. Um, is that not the okay, case? We got the same payment standards. They had incentives. They mm -hmm. had the landlord incentive money. So is there any additional funds that we need to come up with to turn these into EHVs from Mm -mm. We uh, we got funding because, you know, we got the set aside money plus our regular funding. If they do need an incentive, we created some partnerships. Uh, with, what is it? Downtown, Downtown Street? Street. Yeah. yeah, they have money to help uh, somebody that needs a system with housing. So that'll supplement where they used to get incentive from EHV. Yeah. So it's no additional money for the housing authority. Okay. okay. Well, yeah, I mean, as long as it's not a permanent reallocation of the way that we Oh, no, no, it's our it's, selection process for that voucher when it comes back into the pool. No, it's just for these 107 people. If they all come in and find housing, okay. which I doubt it, I doubt it. It'd probably be like 80 of them actually get it, mm -hmm. but the spots are not transferable. The vouchers are not transferable. It's specific to these individuals, and it's not even in the extension. So when they come in and they say they need a um, reasonable accommodation to continue to search, we can't give it because the search is based off the EHB voucher. And so that voucher would be non-existent at that point, and they won't be able to be harvested. Okay. Um, any additional questions um, from commissioners? Otherwise, I'd entertain a motion on this item. Move approval resolution thirty ninety nine. No second. Okay. Um, it's been. Uh, Moved by Commissioner Anderson and seconded by Commissioner Ballesteros. Uh, roll call, please. Okay. Uh, Chair Hans Buller. Yes. Vice Chair Kathleen Bellasaros. Yes. Commissioner Kevin Healy. Yes. Commissioner Francine Goodwin. Yes. Commissioner Yuri Anderson. Yes. Okay, that concludes the vote. Okay, we're going to move on to item 7D, which is resolution. 3100 resolution to authorize Yardy Rent Cafe contract edition. We have finally made it to the point of having a contract addendum for the Yardy system. Uh, we want to go ahead and sign it so we can implement it uh, as soon as possible. Actually, if it's approved tonight, we're going to start implementation tomorrow. Originally, we executed an agreement on March 14, 2017. But there were no online functions except for the HCB department could do online applications. So if we take this, we'll be able to do Rent Cafe, which is online applications, certifications, landlord portal, and then pay scan, which is online payments. And we will retain the Aspire system, which is like a Pentecom University, a little training institute for our early employees. It takes them through uh, several different curriculums that have been created specifically for their jobs, and then they get badges and certificates as they uh, go through that. So it's an extra training platform. The initial cost is $37,892.63. And this also includes 100 additional support hours for $12,000, and it includes the implementation of pay scan. We also got $21,195.70 in credits. And that also includes a $5,000 one-time concession credit. Uh, our normal bill is right at 
So when we do this, the regular bill would go up to approximately $253,000 a year. Um, yard is based on units. So that's why the builders are so much because of the amount of units that we have. But that's also helpful because that's the way that the payments are broken down. So the majority of this will be paid out of the Section 8 program because they have more units than we do in property management. And we have a big enough budget in that to be able to pay it and not put a strain on the program. Um, let's see. Again, the rent cafe, we're gonna have computers set up in some of the properties. So clients who don't have one or don't feel comfortable doing it on their phone, they can go in there and use it. Plus we'll also do like a training session to teach them about it. Uh, pay scan, they'll come and do a training session with finance, teach them how it works, map all the information for us, and then we'll send some out to our vendors. So hopefully all of them will go with ACHs or EFTs. And then Aspire, we're working with that through the human resources to make sure that we keep up to date on the training and have the training available for all of the staff. And Yardy does make all the changes as HUD changes. So not only do they get trained in Yardy, they actually get trained in the new rules for HUD. Uh, like we got the HOPMA coming up, they are already revising the documents and making that part of the training plan. If we find that the SPIRE program is not working, that's something we can just take out the contract. But hopefully, the human resource about the employees will really take advantage of it because it's a really great tool and it'll keep them up to date and make them be able to perform at their job at a higher level. I'll put a copy of the contract on the back, but I strongly recommend that we do it. I think it'll be something that the agency needs to take us in the right direction. It gives us an extra layer of compliance and transparency. And um, again, we can't afford it because of the breakdown with the units by property and program. Okay. Um, is there any uh, public comment specifically relating to resolution 3100? Okay. Uh, any questions or comments from uh, commissioners? I do. Hold on one second. I think we had Commissioner Anderson. Uh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I was understanding the term of the extension. It's through April of 2024. That's for... Well, the um, one-time fee of the 37892, that's to come in on the back end of the existing contract. So all the implementation can be did. We can actually start using it. But then our contract is due every year in April. So then that's when the annual payment will be due for the regular contract. Thank you. Pay so we pay like a lot of so 37 now for this remaining portion. Where is it down here? For this remaining portion of the contract with the implementation, mm -hmm. and then in April we'll pay our regular bill, which will go from April to next year March, which will be the two hundred and I think like fifty three thousand dollars. Okay. Now, okay. if at any time that we have it, if we feel like financially it's a burden or something else happens, we can always suggest it and take away some services and things of that nature. Okay. Um, and then typically when we would approve the or we'll ask to approve the annual extension of the contract. Will that come with an approximation of the breakdown between the program costs? Because mm -hmm. that was one have of the questions. I was like, how are we? Like, oh, yeah, Every yeah. year, what we can do is put the cost sheet on there. It always looked like this. Mm -hmm. And so then they have all the programs up there, how much they cost, how many units we know, with all the credits that we get. Mm -hmm. So just the rent cafe portal, that's the entire agency. Mm -hmm. And then when you see it say um, PHA or PHA African portal, that's section eight. Mm -hmm. And everything that says affordable, that's our actual housing. Because all our housing is under multifamily. So that's how you can tell the difference in the pricing. And then the pay scan is only based on our actual our housing development. That's why pay scan only have like 1,200 or something units which is good because that whole thing is much cheaper. They can't base that off your units for the Section 8 program. Mm -hmm. So they have to just base it off your house and stuff. But yeah, you can get this area because every year you have to sign it. They send one of these sheets to break down all the uh, payments. Thank you. Commissioner Goodwin. Um, my questions are more um, as a uh, Janet, not as a commissioner so much. Um, when um, the information was uh, presented to us 
uh, I believe it was last week, um, it was not received well, uh, which I was expecting that to happen. But um, anyway, um, there was a little bit of confusion um, and, and there was a lot of, um, how do I say, uh, empty spots that couldn't get answered. And so um, that some of the tenants actually believe that we're going to be where the tenants are going to be charged a finance fee for using this. Is that true? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, I don't know, and I didn't. I didn't get that. I I didn't get that. Uh, uh, you know, um, opinion or uh, that's what they kept saying, and I said no. I I don't think so. That was asked, and Sirocco said no. Yeah, and no, so anyway, house, yeah. Okay, I, I didn't think so. Um, but um, I I just want to warn you, you guys are going to be up a um a hard wall <laughs> getting these people to cooperate with most of the people to cooperate with this, uh, because they are not savvy uh, with computers. Um, some people don't even own a cell phone. Um, so good luck. I think it's a great idea. Well, we're going to have to do a little training session, you know, maybe go to each of the properties and kind of walk them through and show them how it is. Because uh, right. really user-friendly, the toolbox when you sign on. Because not only does it have the words, but they have little pictures. So, like, for maintenance, it'll be a little screwdriver, stuff like that, to try to make it as user-friendly as possible. Okay. Uh, right. Um, what was my other question? Um, oh, God, I can't remember now. Um, um, oh, passwords, that was it. They, they were, the way it was explained to, about, uh, to us about passwords was that um, if they were going to use the computers that are downstairs in, in our community room, that everybody had the same password, and that didn't make any sense to me. No, ma'am. The computer have a password on it, but when you log on and you go into the system, then that's when you'll put your credentials in there. So you'll put your name and your password, and nobody else will have that information, not even the housemate or the staff. Okay, so the the passwords are um are are uh, are, are private. Okay, so the only thing, password that is um that is quote unquote public is when we uh, sign into the program. Uh, just when you sign on the computer, and we really could take the password off the computer just to make it easier. And then that way, the only password would be whatever password you create for your profile. Okay. So it's created. Okay. That's what I thought. Now, people that um, are, are uh, computer savvy, have their own equipment at home, their own devices at home, we, can, we don't have to do this downstairs, right? No, ma'am, you can use your own devices, and you can even use your telephone, too. Yeah, I, I did catch that, okay. Because you know, cause there's a lot of people that are, like, you know, running around with their head checked up, chopped off, and, you know, I'm hearing, I'm not doing this, and I'm just going to write a voucher, and, you know, <laughs> or you get a voucher, you know, get not a voucher, a, um, a money order uh, <laughs> come the first, and I'm thinking, I don't argue with them, I just let them, you know, spout their differences and you know they're you know what they're going to do because i can't babysit everybody yeah, but, then, um, uh, but i end i end up getting i kind of end up getting yelled at because of the decisions um which you know i i, I just take it you know um yeah, but they, uh, anyway pay for the money order or something that's fine they can still turn in money orders we really encourage them to pay online but that's something they don't have to do the only thing they really have to use the system for uh, be when they're doing their work orders and turning in information to do their certification. Okay. Oh, you mean for what? For their password, you mean? Uh, like when you have your annual review every year? Yeah, yeah. And then your documents, that's really what it's for. If you want to use it to make your rent payments, that's good too because that option will be there. But if you don't use it for that, we still can take the manual checks and receive them in or money orders. But the research and your, like your social security information, stuff like that, that's what's going through that secure system. Because see, when you send it in, 
Your audit gonna also check it off. So that's how it's helping with compliance because we have a lot of audit findings, but it's gonna flag it if it don't have all the compliance pieces and it won't even let it come through. So that way when the worker get a package, it's a complete package, everything's there, it's electronic, and then they'll work up your research and you'll be able to sign your lease electronic. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's actually really nice. Maybe we need to work a uh, whole day on the presentation, but um, it, I think when people start using it, they find out how friendly it really is and how much time and confusion it's cut so I, that they're going to like it. Yeah, people are afraid of um, anything that's new to them, obviously, and especially, you know, the some of the older seniors, and um, they're, they're afraid of it, and they don't trust it. And so, um, you know, this is where we are now, but, um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. unfortunately, some of them didn't, um, you know, try and learn this stuff, uh, these things earlier in life. Um, and so it's foreign to them. I'm hearing that paying, paying online, though, is optional. Yeah, we, you can't force them to pay all that. But for people who want to, it'll be fantastic because it'll just come straight in. Yeah. But uh, if they want to still bring a money order or a check or whatever, they still can do that. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, I have to believe that this would save money over the long term in terms oh, of it efficiency. Saves a I mean, lot of money. Just the processing, Time the processing of these checks and money orders. And the, mm -hmm. there's got to be long-term serious savings from this it is and then like it really promotes transparency because people are always saying i said this you didn't yeah. get it you know i did this yeah. you didn't get it but now you can just log in and you yeah. see your screen and you see where you sent it and so you really can tell if it's the housing authority or the person um as far as for the checks for paying your rent if you want to, you can go online and have it come out automatic, or you can make the payment. Then you got that paper trail. So it saves a lot of time. It would make your life so much easier once you really get used to using it. And so, and it speed up the process too. And the and landlord the rafters, portal, right? Yes, a landlord portal. Right. And the rafters and inspections will go through here too. So now when somebody get a voucher and they go find somewhere to stay, that normally what they've been doing, they come back, they bring the paper, somebody look at the paper, they do the rent rebounders. It's a longer process than it should be. But if we implement this, they'll do all that online and it'll come up on the tablets. Mm -hmm. And so then even when they do the inspection, they'll do it on the tablet. So as soon as it passes, it come right back through the system, pass yeah. and tell you to go to the next step, which is to have contract and things of that nature. Yeah, uh, yeah I know I'm, I'm for it for the the transition of it, um, especially for people that um end up in the hospital on an emergency basis, um, if they can you know implement this uh, as an automatic payment for their rent, they don't have to worry about it. Because I've had friends that I've had to go up to the hospital and get, uh, you know, their money, uh, get money for their money orders or their checks or you know whatever, um, just so you know, because they'd be in the hospital during the rent when the rent was due. And um, this would be something that, you know, uh, could um, save them that headache. Um, you know, they still have a roof over their head. Not that you guys would throw them out, but, <laughs> but anyway. Um, but anyway, no, I, I think it's a win-win a situation, but it's getting some of these people in here. I got to work on our uh, customer service, too, because I think a lot of times it's how you tell a person something. Yeah. And let them, you know, kind of engage in it because it's test database and stuff like that. So they can practice in there without worrying about messing up their accounts. And that way they can get comfortable with it. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's it's going to take time. You know, it's a, it's a new concept for them. And, um, you know, I mean, like I said, some people don't even have a cell phone. And uh, but but so what you're saying is um, if somebody absolutely does not want to do go this route with the um, cafe. They can still do, use the uh, paper for payments. Pa the, pa for payment, yeah, that's what I meant for payment. For the certifications, they don't have to do this, and so like the first one or two, maybe we have to walk them through it or something. But for the payments, yeah, they can just turn in a check or money order if they want to. They don't have to pay online because I know people do get kind of worried with putting their routing number and checking information online. But uh, yard it is a very secure system. It's a system that's used throughout the United States. It's very heavily encrypted. So it is secure. But yeah, for a payment, if they don't want to use it, they can still turn in, you know, however they've been paying in the pages. 
Well, that's good to hear because that was that wasn't really uh, unless they weren't listening. They um I I didn't get that impression um uh, at the original presentation, but that's really good to hear, and I'm glad you clarified that. I really appreciate that. And um, if it's okay with you, I will pass the word, but I'm going to encourage them to use the um the cafe um the rent cafe um if, yes, if that would be very helpful. Yeah, no, I will. Um, uh, you know, and uh, and I, anyway, I, I I need to learn how to do it myself. Um, because I still don't know what I'm you know going to do. Do I just go into their website? Uh, they gonna come over there and talk to you about it again because they hadn't transitioned to it a hundred percent. That's okay. why we have to do the contract. You know, make sure it's board approved first for the contract, and then okay. we'll be back on the site to talk about it. Okay, so do we not pay our rent then on the first? Do we just hold oh, on? Make sure you still pay your rent. <laughs> you take it to don't don't never not pay your rent. <laughs> okay, so okay, so I I usually write a check or or do a money order, one or the other. Because um, we gotta uh, get pay scanned up and running that finance. So really, the rent payments are probably if this is approved tonight, that'll probably be like in February or March before we know our rent payments. Okay. So Come on live first because we got to get them trained up and do all the implementation. Okay, so it probably won't be kicked off until February or March, you're saying? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I kind of thought so because it, it didn't seem logical, you know, time wise and logistically no, that it, it, would, it would be implemented in, in January. It, it, that didn't make sense to me. So, anyway, that's good to know. Um, Thank you for giving them some breathing uh, space. Uh, to learn it and, you know, get it in their brains that it's not, you know, that in, impossible to learn. But anyway, so that's good to know. So um, come January, we'll be doing, still doing the same old um, rent uh, procedure. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Um, I, that's all I needed to know. Thank you so much. Okay. Chairman, just, yeah. a, just a comment. I think I remember back when online banking began. Yeah. I don't know how many years that's been, but it's been a while, right? And that whole generation of people who began to use online banking, I couldn't live today without, I don't write any checks, sure. right? Everything I do is online banking. I tend to think the difficulty of this is certainly no more difficult than just yeah. doing online banking. Yeah. And it does seem like um, maybe making sure the messaging, particularly for facilities that have a senior population yeah. and making sure we're thinking through that piece of it is really important. No, and we had already made it clear that we, we're not going to just implement it. We are going to have people from the community, like Alliance on Aging, is volunteering to go through the process with us so that they know, and that's a resource that the tenants can use yeah. to be able to assist them whenever they need it. So we're setting that up as well. Mm -hmm. So um, we're not going to just you know, say, here you go, you need to start. We also need to, we, we had instructed staff to print out pamphlets with step-by-step -step instructions that we can hand to the tent. Yeah. So this was kind of like a first, just a meeting, letting them know this is coming. Mm -hmm. So this is not like the last meeting we're gonna have, yeah. or it's not the only meeting we're gonna have. Commissioner mentioned there was a lot of people that were not present. And so those people probably wondering or asking questions because they were not at the meeting, they have all these questions. But we will be at a site again. Um, I'll make, I'll myself, I'll go and do the presentation myself and um, I'll make sure that I answer all the questions because it is a transition mm -hmm. and I wanna make sure that everybody understands. As far as a computer, there's many different ways we can go about it. We can assign, uh, uh, login information to each of the users, each of the tenants, so they have their own individual user. Because if we just keep it open, there is a potential for someone just to go back and look at the history. The and look at yeah. So if we assign individual passwords to each tenant, um, then they have their own password. Whenever they want to use that computer, they just log in. Uh, so there's different things we can do to make sure that there's security. Now the computers that are going to be there, have the same are gonna have the same security, the same level of um, virus protection, everything that we have in our own stations at our desk. And they're gonna be monitored by our IT company. So they're doing the installation, they're doing the deployment, so they're making sure that there's firewalls, that there is antivirus, that there are security measures, so that you know there's not none of these hacking or going to computers that yeah. uh, shouldn't happen. 
So that uh, will give tenants the peace of mind that what I'm entering here is secure, is a secure. So those are things that um, we'll make very clear to um, the residents when, on our next meeting. So mm -hmm. we'll have more meetings. This is not the only one. It seems like maybe even in addition to the meetings, having like some office hours or something where you can walk somebody through it for the first time. Mm -hmm. the yeah, we we talking to Gardy to set up some uh, test users or test uh, tenants mm -hmm. so that we can use those when we do these presentations and have a projector show them step-by-step. Step. This is what you're going to see on the screen. This is what you're going to receive. Yeah. And again, those will be uh, together with visuals that they can keep for themselves uh, for reference. Yeah. So we're working on all of that with uh, our team from the garden. I think that's good. I think there's still potential for breakdown from going from a PowerPoint to implementation, especially yeah. for like a senior. So having, you know, hey, we're gonna be there for three hours this evening, such and such an evening, and yeah. if you need help, come yeah. find us. What I'm doing is, I was gonna, especially with certain sites, I was gonna implement uh, monthly meetings. Mm -hmm. That way, our staff there is there available for any questions. Yeah. You know, we, we're gonna be here from this time to this time. If you have questions, if you're having problems, if you need to learn how to use this software, then we can sit down with you and go over it. Yeah. Again, that will be in addition to whatever resources or agencies in the community we can get to help us with this transition. That's good, Jose, but make sure too that the property manager uh, is doing that because they there all the time. Mm -hmm. And so no matter how much you go to the site, if the property manager is not being you know, helpful and accommodating, it's not going to work. So yeah. we need to know how important it is that they're uh, really active and engaging and not waiting on you or your supervisors to come on. Yeah, so I'm, I'm doing that. I'm going to, I'm going to go to, depending on the geographic location, so for Monterey, we'll have one. I'll have the staff that work in Monterey be there so that they know how they need to present it and what they need to express to the residents. And then I'll do one in South County and one in Salinas. That way, the staff from that geological area, they can attend, they can see, and then they can start doing those meetings, uh, recurring meetings with the residents. So that way, I'm not having to go to the site all the time. Okay. Any other comment on this, or uh, anybody ready to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve um, 3100. I'll second it. Um, it's been moved by Commissioner Valsteros and seconded by um, South Commissioner Booter. Chair Hans Booter? Yes. Vice Chair Kathleen Bellastaros? Yes. Commissioner Kevin Healy? Yes. Commissioner Francine Goodwin? Yes. Commissioner Yuri Anderson. Yes. That concludes the roll call vote. Okay. Um, and I believe that uh, there is someone in the room here in person who had intended to make a public comment um, earlier. And um, I wanted to give that person a chance to make a public comment here. Uh, do you have uh, three minutes? Yeah. Oh, I can talk about anything or something? Just what you guys were talking about. Um, you can talk about. I think you had something um, that you wanted to speak on. Um, oh, about the housing, yeah. Yeah, my name is Rosalina Grandolt, and he's my husband, Mr. Chan Grandolt. The reason that I did because when I contacted Monica Perales, uh, she um, not responded upon call, not responded to um, writing notes. And that's it says the reason under here because also I received workers' comps and I invest in immigration purposes in Mexico City. And I received this 5,000 budget, but it's for my school because I need to, to transfer unit to university. The workers' comp provider made this budget and this say it's not accountable for the situation in housing at all. And when they establish contact with, um, assistant of the Monica Perales, I forget the name, she has this money and, and the voucher I need to pay. And, and that says, says the reason I'm worried about this one because we may higher level my payment. In other words, what she's saying, this money right here that is not supposed to be counted for housing, period. It's, it's void. And I'm not saying it's supposed to, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But my whole thing is this. So since August, my wife ain't been working. And we've been to this office. 
I never met my workers. Never. It's like a robot. They never, <laughs> the last three years, I never met them. They never called my house. And I left no BS, like about a hundred something things. Not, you know, how you say that, you know, getting on their nerves. And people, yeah. Come on. You got to call in months. That's how much. And they never come. We leave things here. They never respond. We still pay 800, eight, almost $890. But I'm, don't even make that much. Mm -hmm. And they're charging me over for, oh, okay. since we've been living here. So, you know, she ain't working now, but they're still charging us $890. And we already done put our paperwork in the whole time and they never got back to it. We'll go right here to the office, right? The first thing is, oh, call here, give us a number and it goes right to the voicemail. Never get an answer, never. And my worker, Diane Reeves, I have never even met that lady. Yes, I and I left over a thousand messages with her. And this new one, she don't even call us. When we call them, this one up here, this, oh, call that number, Diane, whatever. You know what I'm saying? And then when we ask what's happening, I come up here, I used to come up here all the time just to find out what's happening, but I'm not one of them, you know, bad person, whatever, from Maggie. But I have, in the last three years since we've been on house, I never met my worker. Mm -hmm. Never got a phone call back. But yet, they're supposed to be fair housing. They're supposed to answer our questions. But our money, what, what happens? If I don't pay rent, what happens? I get kicked out. And my money's, I make 602. They're charging me 800 and something, almost 900 dollars. It's my underhead of the household. She don't work. She's no. legal now. Watch this. She's legal now. I understand that when she wasn't legal, they jacked our rent up. That's all good and dandy. But we've been, she's been legal now. And she's not been working. So I, I think, exactly we, I think we're saying. reading it loud and clear. That that is your three minutes, but I think we we get the impression and we're definitely gonna look into it. So thank you for okay. bringing that to our attention. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, we're going to move back to um, item uh, 7E, which is resolution 3101, Memorandum of Understanding with Monterey County Behavioral Health for the Utilization of Behavioral Health Bridge Housing Funds. Chair, if I might, I would like to recuse myself from this discussion. I think, given my yeah. work with the county, it's best yeah. enough just to yeah. Yeah. let me know when I can come. Yeah, you bet. And, and somebody remind me about that. Call me by him. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll so just be reading my book. Okay, well, um, for the last couple of months, I've been working with the Mobile County Behavior. Mobile County. Monterey County, I gotta move somewhere to go have a young and um, <laughs> with the behavioral health, the health staff. We put in and packaged the grant for bridge housing funding for $11,301,966. The grant was awarded conditionally based on some documents that have to be executed and turned back in which this MOU is one of them. Um, the way that we have it uh, situated is that we will work with County Behavioral Health to lease up the 55 units that's at PDM. Um, they will subsidize the rent for those units and they will do it for four years. They will also pay the security deposit for each unit. And if it's a maintenance damage where we have to charge, they're going to be responsible for that. We will have a provider that will be on site. The county is going to pick who that is through our RFP. That provider will be responsible for working with all of the tenants there, providing tenants to move in and move out and transition them through the program. But that entire expense will be on the county. We do not have any of that burden. And whether or not that person is successful, they still have to pay us for the 55 units because we're making the units available specifically for this program. Uh, the way that the program is going to work, it does adhere to the current deed restrictions because right now it's two deed restrictions on the property. One, they have to meet HUD's uh, definition of homelessness. And the other one is that it has to be transitional housing. 
So this is a transitional housing program and the people that they refer to the program will meet the definition of homelessness. So even though their provider is going to be doing the um, referrals and help them moving the people in and out, our property management team will still do an interview, make sure that we're in compliance and keep our records so that we can show HHS that the property is being ran in compliance. The way this was set up, when this program is over, PDM was supposed to be out of the deed restrictions. <laughs> However, due to the low vacancy rate, instead of making us pay a fine, they're going to add probably another year on to the deed restriction because of the vacancy rate for the past year, mm -hmm. which is fine. And I did also tell them behavioral health because they're going to give us $2.8 million to do rehab work. This does, this does not entitle them for us to automatically renew this when this funding is over. When this funding is over, everybody will come back together. If we can mutually agree on an amount of rent and they have funding available, we will bring it for board approval to do the program again. If they do not have the funding available, then the program will just end along with that grant. That way we're not in a long-term contract. Um, so the rehab money that they're going to give us if we do this is $2,825,492. We'll receive $27,500 in security deposits, and then we'll get $3,037,313 in subsidized rent. And this is for the next four-year period. So in all, we'll get $5,862,805, excluding the security deposits. Uh, I think this is a great program. I think that it really meets, uh, meets the criteria that we need at PDM. This is a property that has not been making money for a long time. And I think that it actually owes the agency about a million dollars uh, right now. So in doing this, we'll be able to rehab it and bring the property home and actually pay the agency back some of the money that was owed from the years that we put it to bill when it ran short. And when the program is over, either we extend it, depending on what the next rent might look like if it's one available, or at that time, you own it outright. So there'll be a lot of other options you could do because the transitional housing It'll either be depleted or have like a year or less to do. So that would be something we probably could work our way out of. Along with this MOU, we had to do a new uh, HHS application, but it's basically the same as the initial application that we did in 2016. It's just making some adjustments for this particular grant. So that's being worked on. We should have that in before the end of this week. Um, but we just need to know if the board will approve us to go ahead and engage in this MOU. Okay. Um, uh, any comments from the public on resolution uh, 3101? Okay, hearing none. Uh, comments are from commissioners and questions for Zalika on this. I would just like to offer a comment of commendation of this. Being, being on the board for a number of years now, this is the best outcome that I've seen for this particular property and this particular program thus far. So kudos to Zalika and the entire staff for putting together such a um, collaborative and mutually beneficial agreement. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I concur. I mean, I think it's great for the community. Obviously, it was an underutilized property, and there's clearly need for it you know there's folks that fall into this category here in the county and um so it's a great collaboration i think between the county and the house authority is anyone interested in making a motion at this point i'll make a motion for resolution second okay uh it's uh, been forwarded by commissioner ballesteros and uh, seconded by commissioner healy and roll call please Chair Hans Buter? Yes. Vice Chair Kathleen Bellasaros? Yes. Commissioner Kevin Healy? Enthusiastically, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Francine Goodwin? Yes. And we have an extension from Yuri Anderson. Speaking of Yuri Anderson, can somebody go, Trevor? 
And thank you for your patience with all of the resolutions today, but we clean the house at the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to preach just a bit. Two commissions. I'm sorry, Yuri abstained from this one? Yeah. Okay. Um, we are going to move on to um, item 8A, uh, the human resources. Well, good evening, everyone, and members of the board. Uh, this is an HR report for the last uh, kind of meeting of the year. I did want to kind of highlight some of the, some uh, things that we're focusing on as far as uh, safety. Um, recently, we've been having kind of the talks in the last kind of couple of board meetings regarding the workers' complaints that have been increased. Um, so part of that is kind of looking and taking a deeper dive into the training programs that we have here at ACRA. Um, it has kind of not been so, um, you know, apparent and not kind of been kind of carried on throughout the years. So I want to kind of reinvest into that program and kind of revamp all the process of the different years that we have. Um, a lot of the stuff that we have, which is part of the training modules that we currently offer, whether it's through Velocity, which is our HRIS platform, or even through Yardi. Um, are they not being taken advantage of and I'm not trying to stream like that to kind of make it stronger for our employees overall, especially within the maintenance department. Um, because that's where kind of the core area of kind of the workplace um, workers' comp things that we're actually facing. Um, so kind of to kind of stream like that to, uh, to kind of um, make sure that we promote that, we're going to kind of have discussions throughout the year in the next coming, you know, couple of months of how we're going to kind of tailor that training program um, right now, we are looking at kind of doing HR audit, which also concludes the OSHA um, kind of requirements of the state, but also what's in compliance with um, labor laws as well. So we're trying to kind of factor in everything and to kind of put it in one whole um, training program and kind of launch it out to our employees throughout the um, agency. Um, and then as we move forward, the employee spotlight. Um, I do want to kind of highlight that. Um, I guess a few years ago, we did kind of have that policy that was in place where we kind of identify employees within the agency, kind of spotlight them, kind of boost morale within the agency, as well as kind of give someone kind of that pedestal to stand on um, that we're actually, you know, supporting inclusion within the agency. That is part of um, the policy that I want to kind of reintroduce and reinforce um, today. Um, part of that is involving the directors of each department to kind of nominate someone in their department and kind of highlight whether they, you know, whether they have good attendance, um, you know, their team collaboration, excellence with performance and overall, and there's a procedure. So that's going to be kind of featured in the next coming year as well. Um, recently, we also had, uh, which is last week, Yardi training. And I, I know I mentioned this last month as well. Uh, we did have Yardi training for um, property management departments and also the finance departments. The feedback that I did receive from both directors was that it was um, very informative, kind of a refresher course for them. It did kind of go over the um, basic practices um, about Yardi and what we do and, and how to maximize the usage of it. Um, they are excited to learn a little bit more, so we are going to kind of continue working with Yardi to see what we can streamline more uh, training um, kind of modules for them to kind of continue with that learning curve. Uh, recruitment and staffing, we should be able to look out for the director of the programs. Uh, we do have some six candidates, I believe, that's lined up. So Salik and I have reviewed the resumes and we are setting up those reviews um, hopefully by the end of the year, which is on the 29th is what the schedule date is. Um, housing program supervisor, we just opened it up externally. Um, internally, we did have one person that implied. And the housing development analysts are also um, having interviews um, being conducted as we speak or um, as we hit processes. Um, new employees is Michael Romero, who's a new accounting assistant. Carlos Lopez, our resident caretaker, Raquel Carranza, which is our first date today, and then Myra. I know I, I think I mentioned it last month, but she is our new interim housing program supervisor until we can find a replacement for her. Um, terminated employees, we did have two uh, Justin uh, uh, Contreras and Stacy Pierce, and then we have one temporary employee. Um, this report, I did want to include some kind of 
informational charts. If you guys can see on the report, it does kind of showcase exactly where um, the tenure is throughout our agency and those who actually have been working with us um, over the, um, throughout. So as you can tell, 10 years and up is kind of 34 people have been here for 10 years and up and then kind of goes back down. Kind of give you kind of a snapshot of it. And then below that, it's the generation at a glance. I never shared this before. Um, this kind of shows you exactly kind of where um, generation, where the baby boomers are at, right, the millennials, and where we're hiring, the headcount of it, and then also what, how, where we'll be charmed as well. So kind of an overview and a snapshot of it. Um, and then the, towards the bottom is the workplace safety issues that I referenced above recently um, in regards to workers' claims. Um, it's still September 23 right now. And the employee relations plans is still at zero. Unless there's any questions from the commissioners or the board, I'm open. Any any questions on the HR report? Um, one stupid question: termed. What does that mean? In the short report. Um, that one is just kind of showing our overall kind of churn rate from last year um, to compared to this year. How long they've been with it? I don't. Is it terminated? Like, terminated. Terminated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. On there. Um, and then on the employee spotlight, um, I serve as an alternate on the transportation agency board, mm -hmm. and they do a similar program it's called the transportation employee of the quarter. Mm -hmm. And one thing I've noticed that seems a little different than how your policy outlined is it's actually nominated by the agency staff. So I don't know if that's a part of your policy or your program as well, where employees have an opportunity to contribute names as opposed to just directors yeah. um, as a chance for people to be celebrating their co-workers. I wanted, I wanted to kind of make it kind of more easier for right now. Can mm -hmm. we do like a test to see how, you know, how receptive the team of um, the directors are with it and then the nominations and then kind of trickle down to the staff as well. Once we get kind of more of a, a process in place and mm -hmm. kind of get going, then they can get more involved and they can nominate and then give it to the director and then the director can do the same steps as well. So it's just kind of more of uh, just reintroducing it, mm -hmm. see how well it goes since it hasn't been active for quite some time. Great, I think yeah. that's great. I think and if people know that at some point they're down the road, they're gonna have an opportunity to get yeah. some, I think it's helpful because it's, it is good to be recognized by your supervisors, but also I think the recognition by peers, peers can also feel really nice and also not like, you know, teacher's pet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jim. Yes, you're welcome. Good report. Any other any other questions? I do have one comment before we move uh, forward. We will be having one more vacancy that I'll be advertising for. Miss Carolina is leaving us. Um, I think this week Thursday or maybe yeah. next uh, next week. Yeah, sometime next week will be her last day. Mm -hmm. So I want to let the board know that we will be advertising externally soon for the regular development. And we will miss you, Carolyn. It's been a fun, what, year? A year <laughs> with you and 22 and yeah. everybody else. Exactly. So <laughs> we will be advertising. I'll miss you guys, too. Are you moving on to a new thing, or are you retiring? I wish I could retire. No. <laughs> <laughs> I still got to work. That's the point. Yeah, something new. Yeah, well, good luck, Carolina. We thank I mean, you. It's been a, it's been a a long a um, long ride here with you. Yes, <laughs> um, I'm very young when I started. <laughs> yeah, my son was very young, so yeah, mm. it's been good. Lots of good memories and yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna go to the finance report. Mike. Yeah, this is where all the excitement is. <laughs> there has been a lot of excitement in finance in the last uh, thirty to sixty days, and it continues. Uh, a lot of a lot of movement. So, uh, as I mentioned here, uh, the Audits continue to be a major priority. Uh, Kim is doing uh, working yeoman's work with other members of our staff and to get these uh, audits along. Uh, Kim, if you do, you want to make just a summary of where we stand. I mean, I have your notes here that you gave me this afternoon. 
Um, even from even from what I wrote on here, which was done on December seventh, there there've been some retirements. <laughs> You've moved some things along. Um, right now, the HDC audit is our priority because we can't finish the Hackam audit until the HDC audit is completed. And I just sent Zuliga the confirmations, and it's going into partner review. So all I have to do is wait for them <laughs> to review it, and everything if everything's okay, that should be completed. And they had the final trial balances sent to the Hackam people who are doing the Hackam audit. And that was one of the last things they needed also. So if they don't have any further questions, both audits should be completed by year end. Um, tying in, we're in discussion with the asset manager and hopefully that one should be done, I'm hoping this week. And then PDM, we're waiting for one last item and the FLC is also one last item. And then those should be completed also and then we'll be Caught up with that, except for three for yeah, we'll, 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 yeah, and we're hoping that'll get done so we'll have like at least a couple months of downtime. So, good, thank you. So, in the month of October, which is the latest month uh, close that we're showing and reporting on this month, uh, just again, it's kind of a repetition, but we have uh, engaged with BDO, the uh, accounting firm, to do 20 of our properties. The reason we did that is we wanted to upgrade our skill sets. So there are uh, people no longer with the agency that were at one time. And now we can call upon CPAs and true accountants to help us with those 20 properties. Uh, 10 plus properties remain in our hands. And we do them ourselves. And then along as with all of the other typical functions within the department, uh, so we are at current uh, headcount quite busy. Uh, we do look forward to the new uh, automated AP. It's, it's going to be pretty slick move forward. So basically, we're going to be moving more towards paperless. Uh, we'll also see an interaction between the purchasing function and module with more connection connectivity with AP. So when you have a purchase order, you can uh, say you want to buy something and then you get a, you know, you can say I've received it. So now it's really ready for payment and it all kind of seamlessly uh, happens and and the uh, approval can be electronic and it's just really moving away from kind of like accounting done in the 1900s. <laughs> Move into this century. So it's, um, if you're familiar with a company called Concur, uh, SAP picked them up a few years ago. Uh, they do automated uh, expense reports. And uh, it's interesting that the CalCard that we use, uh, they're even, they're owned by US Bank. They're even moving towards uh, the same kind of concur automated features. So we use CalCards here. We have about 40 of them. So there's just a lot of uh, Zuleika's leadership in, in pushing us to being more, you know, using electronic tools, staying away from the spreadsheets and living on out, out of the system. So the training we received recently uh, from James and uh, we appreciate that very much. It's help. Um, we're also using a tool called, called Smartsheet. I think I've mentioned this before. This was the first month that we actually loaded it up with all of the uh, reports that were generated uh, we have some hiccups in some of our reports as we get deeper into actually using reports that haven't been used in the past. We actually find some mistakes, right? So, uh, but the Smartsheet tool basically allows us to have every one of our locations that we manage and all of the P&Ls and balance sheets are there, as well as uh, the information that we're talking about tonight is stored there. So if I ever want to go back or let's say, uh, James or Jose wants to go and look at their departmental uh, performance. They can just go click in there. They have access into a reserved spot and they can see their own information. So they don't have to come and ask me, print it out. It's, it's there for you, which I think is um, it's pretty slick. That's up uh, with many other companies I've worked with and better than a lot. So uh, pat on the back too. 
our group and uh, and to the agency in moving in that direction. Uh, as we mentioned just now, PayScan, Rent Cafe, those will affect the county, and I think uh, very positively. Uh, the more people that use electronic payment, of course, the less checks we have to process. That's a good thing. And there's less chance for, for error. We continue to work on cash management. I'm working on some cash uh, management tools where I can look out into the future and really get a, a grip on uh, uh, how much we spend and where we spend it and then trying to tie it into our sources of revenue. By having these audits done, we're going to get access to, to additional money that right now is held up because of the audits, which will improve our cash flow and reduce my stress, um, which is good. Um, stress is bad. And in summary of for the numbers right now, if you look at the very last portion down there, um, after five, you know, after four months, uh, we and what's interesting is that I looked at the expenses for AP uh, last year. We spent about twenty million. This year, we're on track to spend again twenty million. So I feel comfortable that the you know we kind of have a, a grip on our spend rate, and we were actually fairly close to budgeted numbers. If you look at uh, Hackham performance, uh, very close to our. Uh, predicted uh, October income statement or surplus or deficit and year to date uh, again we're, we're actually at about a $300,000 gain uh, surplus so that's that's positive um, in the past we I think we had some pretty big variances where numbers were were way off so this is even if these aren't necessarily um, Perfect numbers, they're at least directionally, I feel like we're going, I'm feeling more like they're becoming my numbers, like I understand them better. And we'll work as a, a team to become uh, more involved in the numbers. And as we budget this next coming year, we'll improve on the process we had this year, which was getting sort of toe in the water. I want everybody to be swimming with me, right? Our numbers, not just accounting numbers. So again, Hackam for the month was uh, was a good month. Um, HDC, we because we have some trailing income expectations. These are these kinds of projects where we get maybe their waterfall payments or other sources. I think we're going to see them come later in the year, but right now we're we're kind of uh, trailing. So there is actually a loss in the HDC uh, side of the business. But if you take everything together and add them up. Uh, year to date, we're at about five hundred and seventy thousand dollars unfavorable, uh, which is based upon the amount of money spent so far, not too bad, and and that is based on uh, you know some of these trailing payments. So I think we're going to see that uh, diminish as we go forward. So overall, I think our financial situation uh, is is better understood. Uh, we would love to have uh, more cash so we have less. Uh, less uh, creativity on that side. I think I mentioned uh, in a past month, I talked to a, a gentleman, Aaron, over at uh, Santa Cruz, and I asked him, well, do you have the type of problem that I face? And he says, oh, no, I got plenty of money. So it is possible. And I think we're working in the direction of getting to that place. And that's that's good. Questions on the, on the finance report? I mean, I, I think, uh, obviously, you know, you coming in, Mike, and um, there's obviously a lot of turnover in an apartment, and, um, you know, I think stabilizing things is the first order of the priority, and, you know, getting these audits caught up, you know, it's, I think it's been a big lift, and bringing in BDOs, I think it's going to give everybody more confidence, and hopefully also, you um, some knowledge and skills transfer, you know, hopefully in that process. Um, my only comment is I wanted to acknowledge those things because that is rightfully, I think, where your attention has been. I think, like, one thing that I would love is trying to figure out how we can make this, like, the finance report. And it's it's not just 
this. Well, it's been this way since I've been here. I'm trying to make it just more robust and more maybe meaningful for commissioners. Um, I mentioned this last time and Kevin kind of had some fun with me, but at one point we did have a presentation, uh, kind of a learning session for commissioners and we had um, a consultant who was an expert in housing authority finances. And they had some great ideas about how we could make um, our um, board packets more robust in this area. And I do think sort of as part of our retreat, it should be something that we should talk about. Um, you know, and, and Mike, I also know that you've got great experience, but also not necessarily in this area, right? And so I think there are some key metrics that they highlighted that are very like housing authority specific uh, that would be beneficial for us to understand and to track with some kind of dashboard. Um, so well, that's you know, us, once again, we exactly on the same page because we are already working with BDO. The January finance board package should look totally different because they're helping us to put together a new finance packet to hit all those metrics. Yeah. But when I, I like the packet now to me, it's just voluminous. You got all these pages, but what do they really mean? Mm -hmm. So they're going to put it into format where you can see how each property is cash flowing or not cash flowing, how the Section 8 program is written. Mm -hmm. Because even if, though it's a pass through, we still have admin money, things like that. So we're working on a new report. And I think he said, hey, did you say he had ready for January? Oh, Mike, so he's... Well, I think he, honestly, I think he's going to start it because it's it, it's the their year end and, yeah. you know, but we're on the same page in that yeah. he's, I've talked to him a couple of times. Jake is our partner that we work with. Yeah. Um, he has a boss, Nick, but Jake is the guy that I work with. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, you know, we have so, so many clients like yourself that we've done this for. I was going to say, it must be just. It really should be someone on the shelf. Probably they, based, yeah. 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 And they use yard, right? So I do think that we can make some pretty quick. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be a much better board. Yeah, that's great. I mean, and, and maybe there's a, a board learning session at some point um, where we get a little bit of training on some of those key metrics. So anyway, that's that's great. Um, any other comments on the finance report? I had a comment. It's, I guess what's on the report on one of the things you said, Mike, that just really struck me and I hope is that you're finding success um, that you wanted, it sounded like your goal in the next year is for the agency to view the finances as ours and not just the finance department. And I think that that is a really good goal to have and that you're getting partnership from your other directors so that people are managing this budget together versus like, you gave this to me and I, I'm just doing it. So yeah, I'm pretty I really, that. I really feel the support. Uh, it's there. We just have to do a better job of making it easier for them to engage with us, right? If if it's a difficult process and the thing feels disconnected or confusing, then it's hard for you guys to say, well, what do you yeah. what do you want me to do? Yeah, I'm running a department before and you don't and you're like, I don't understand my budget. And so you disconnect, right? Like right. And for, so it's really important that that go both ways so that they can be managing those things. And so for instance right now if you go in and look in that spreadsheet you can find your department is there really it's the first time i've ever even looked at it and so there is hr right and there is uh maintenance and and i'm seeing that i'm going wow you know i've really been so high up that it's interesting now we have all the 30 properties listed there i can go click in on any one of them and see if they're positive or negative i was going in and looking at these different properties and realizing that if i took the number and subtracted out the depreciation then on cash you know, how close do I get to the zero, right? Mm -hmm. Are they really zero or still, at least on paper, losing money? Mm -hmm. So it, it, that's a level of, of knowledge that's taken me literally eight months to get to a point where I kind of understand what's going on. Yeah. Uh, and I think it will be accelerated. Yeah. That's great. And I just got one little comment for y'all. I'm it. All of your old budgets is overstated because they just spend way too much money. So if you look on there and see that good money, that's not what you're going to get. There you go now. Because they will spend way too much. So, so, so just add some, negative. Uh, I have to just put it out there and let y'all know because they were just spending money. You know, it was like the money was a band aid. So you can look at your number 
I think, I think Zulika is the queen of the square root. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we are um, we are already at an hour and a half, so we're going to move along to uh, the property management report. All right. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to just thank uh, James for the yard training. We completed that training last week. It was very, very, very informational for us. I mean, we went over some of the day-to-day -day operations that we found out features in URD that were not utilizing that could make our lives a lot, a lot easier for us and staff. Um, so I talked to them about your request, uh, Commissioner Neary, about um, trying to get a report for the waiting list. So there is not one reporting yardie, but they are going to help me get a report that gets me some of that information. And also um, the report on the work orders. So they're going to get uh, get me some uh, help to create those reports because there's, there's there's not one that it's out of the box that can give me that information. So hopefully by next month, I'm able to get those reports and then I will include those uh, numbers on the so overall, the uh, you know the training was great. So thank you, um, James. Um, I'm also working with uh, uh, Carolina. We're going to be submitting uh, uh, the uh, organizational clearance certificate for Puerto La Vista. That is a, a document that we need to submit to be able to get uh, the tax exemption for that property. Uh, we've never been able to receive that, and we are paying about a hundred thousand dollars a year in taxes. So um, I mean, uh, we're engaging a legal counsel to assist us with that process. So we have a meeting scheduled for this Wednesday. And then um, hopefully we can get um, that uh, certification. That way we can get our tax exemption and we can stop paying that money. Anyway. So that's uh, that's being worked on. Um, I have the, uh, the RFP for uh, the PDM rehabilitation. I'm getting together with uh, procurement uh, tomorrow to go over that and then review it, give it to Solita for final review and then advertise it. And that is to do the rehab work that uh, is going to be done at PDM from the grant that Solita mentioned earlier for the PDM project. So that is uh, going to be um, reviewed and given to Solita by the end of this week so that we can advertise that. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we uh, installed a desk already uh, at some of the properties where we are going to be deploying computers. IT has gone out there. They've given us a, a quote that computers are ready to be deployed. Um, so we should be uh, hopefully installing those computers uh, by next week if everything goes well. We will continue, like I mentioned, uh, meetings with the residents. And then um, we will provide um, other assistance, as I mentioned, with uh, some of the agencies from the community. Um, we are also setting up, uh, we're gonna start setting up inventory at different sites. We already got a listing of the sites that we'll be able to hold the inventory um, so that we can create those inventory locations in Yardi, start allocating parts to those uh, inventory uh, locations. And that will mean that we will no longer house um, all the materials here at the property that will cut down on driving time uh, from staff having to come here to pick up parts um, for reporting here in the morning, we can report directly to the site. So they will cut down driving gas costs and any time wasted here will report parts. So that's on the works already. And um, I will work with Elena to set up those uh, inventory locations in Yardi um, as that is something that needs to be done prior to us moving the inventory to the sites. Um, we're also uh, met with uh, Spectrum for the King City Migrant um, internet installation uh, process. They're going to be installing fiber optic in the King City Migrant. Uh, we did the uh, kickoff meeting and then we also met with their staff at the site to do the survey. So that's already been completed. Um, we are doing the end, uh, end of the year reporting for the King City Migrant, which is going to be sent uh, to OMS this week. So that uh, we'll be completing the uh, season for this year. And uh, we also signed the child care center uh, agreement already. We've been sent to the uh, child care center there. So we're back on uh, updated lease with them. Um, for the red properties, the advanced installation in South County has been completed. Uh, 
All the repairs for the accident at, at 1011 East Laurel have been completed. Uh, we had a, a, a sump pump that failed at 44 Natividad. That's a big, big issue at that property because I hope, uh, just so that I can have some context, the uh, street level is higher than where that property sits. So we had to have uh, two tanks, one for storm water and one for sewage. And we have to have some pumps that pump all that to the uh, street level uh, sewage. So one of those pumps fails. Um, and we were in the process of replacing it when the other one failed. So that's a big problem because if there's any sewage overflowing, there's fields right behind the property and any sewage village that goes into those fields or if that were to happen, it would be a big, big problem. So we um, already ordered two pumps, but they're not, not your conventional pumps. They're very difficult to get. So we ordered two. They uh, should be here next week, but we are going to order two additional pumps just to have them as backup in the event they fail, because that would be a, a huge problem. So that is, it's being done and uh, we should have the backup pumps in about three weeks, three, three or four weeks, but the uh, um, replacement pumps for the existing pumps will be here by next week. So that problem will be um, taken care of. Right now we have a temporary pump there um, that is working, but we, we just wanna avoid any issues with, with that spillage from that. So that's being worked on. Um, we're also um, going to have to have a project there for a retaining wall that needs to be at the same property because there is a, there's a, a lot of erosion at that property. We need to uh, build a retaining wall. So I think the architect already has the plans, which is needing, which is uh, need some estimates on the cost, and then it will be provided to HCC for review, and if well, and then we'll request money from the replacement research to be able to complete that repair. We um, it's going to be a, a, a very long and tall uh, retaining wall, so it's going to be an expense, a big expense. But uh, we'll keep the board and. The executive director as well as HTC appraised as a progress as that uh, project uh, continues to progress. Um, we completed the CCRC inspections for Hacienda three and four. We uh, submitted all data to the city. Um, and then Portola Vista, uh, we got the quotes for that repair that I mentioned last meeting uh, for the bay window. We got three quotes now, so I'm going to be uh, reviewing those quotes. And then, uh, you know, we'll be making a selection and then I'll pass the information over to Sulico for final approval since it's over my uh, signature. Link. And uh, PDM, as I mentioned, we are working with uh, Sulika on the project. She went over MOU, the repairs, and we'll be doing the, uh, the RFP this week. Uh, the rent increases for Chula and Salinas FLC, we did send a revised. Um, uh, budget to uh, USDA, and we're waiting for them uh, to answer. We created a packet with a study, a rent study, and we made a rent a narrative. We sent it to uh, USDA. They they responded, but they wanted us to uh, change some of the numbers. So uh, Mike, his team, and uh, with Solika, Solika's uh, suggestions, we, we came to an agreement as to what we were going to be changing the uh, budgets to. And those were sent over. And we're just pending a response on that um, on those rent increases. So we are hopefully they'll respond before the end of the year. And those are the highlights. Um, any any other commissioners or anybody has any questions? Questions? <clears throat> I think it was very thorough, Jose. Um, uh, thank you for putting that together. Um, well, I just have yeah. a question and comment. Um, I don't know if you do the yeah, annual work, but I think you might consider the new story around fiber optic for the King City Library. You know, there's been a lot of statewide conversation about the need for broadband and connectivity, and here we are making that possible in one of our centers. I think it would be a great story, a chance for us to share some good work, additional good work we're doing. Yeah, it's been a great, um, we, we got that grant. I mean, it's, it's very good news for us because internet service in that area, it's a big problem. Uh, currently, we're actually using a hotspot because there's no service in the area that is reliable. 
And um, right now with the fiber addition to that uh, center, it opens up uh, the infrastructure for other facilities around the, the center that can potentially use that infrastructure that is being brought to that community. So you just made my good news story, good news story even better. Like yeah. it's, it's a story to tell. Yeah. <laughs> My only comment is um, the same comment I made last time on the work orders. I'm trying to remember, I feel like Luika, you may have said that this would be taken care of like when we do Red Cafe, but on, on work orders, I would love to see like the timing element of, you know, how quickly are we getting to people's, you know. Yeah, and that's part of the, the uh, questions I had for Yardi. So yeah. they did, there is a report right now, but it's not quite exactly, it won't produce the data that you, you were asking for, but um, they are creating a, a custom report for us that will have those metrics and then you'll be able to see them. Yes. So, we'll, awesome. um, and we're working with also, since we implemented uh, uh, a mobile maintenance, uh, we want to make sure that that's integrated into our current software and that it transfers all the data. So we're checking all of that, you'll generate a report and hopefully as soon as that is available, I'll be uh, adding it to the uh, to the board. I'll be report. That's great. Sorry, Chair, I have one more question. Yeah. Um, so I think this is maybe my fourth meeting now, um, and I'm completely able to read these life step reports. I'm just wondering what exactly they're trying to communicate to us, and what as a board are we being asked to? Do? How are we being asked to engage with this information that's being provided? It's informational. Is we have to have. Resident services at some of the tax credit properties. So they are our provider for those services. So what they do is they provide these monthly reports that we look at it to see what kind of activities are happening at the property, what services they're providing to the residents. And these are informational for us to be able to have and to look at and review to make sure that those activities are happening at the properties. Yeah. So this is us being in compliance with a requirement. With for grant grant. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, we are going to move on to uh, the development report. I'll just highlight a couple of things. We converted to perm financing for one park side. That was great news. At the end of November, we met the deadline that we had with the bank. We were able to get some deferred developer fee that we hadn't gotten. So that's a great thing. And got some half of reimbursables back to the agency. Um, so now we're on to tax credit place of service package. So that should be done within the next um, couple of months. So we're on, back on track with that development. Um, the work that's being done at Tynan Village Building C, the contractor's at 60% complete. Uh, the city was out there and passed the lab inspection. So they're going to start the scratch coat next. So hopefully no more than 30 to 45 days, they'll be done and everything will be completed now with the remediation work at China Village. Um, we've got a couple of Project Bait Section 8 HAP contracts that we're going to be finalizing soon um, for Zuliga to execute. So we're working with a couple of our partners on that. Um, and then as far as you know, future development activities, I know there's some notes in my report. I think you'll see a lot more detail in the coming months. We've had a couple of meetings and, and you know, working with Night Development and other consultants, um, it looks very promising in the next couple of months to see more activity. We've had a lot of meetings, so that's moving along well. And then anything else, if anybody's got any questions on any other items on here, I'm happy to answer. Any questions in the development report? <clears throat> I just want to make a comment. Uh, I had a conversation today with a a co-worker from a prior company over in Pajaro, pretty large food company. And, uh, you know, we talked about uh, the size. Sometimes it's hard to imagine how much destruction there was, mm -hmm. but they had probably a five acre manufacturing site. He said the entire site had two feet of water over everything. So the whole warehouse, the entire manufacturing, and all the, all the front offices, mm -hmm. everything, two feet of water. So you just imagine the people that live there, right? And what destruction level must have been for the people in their own residential homes and so forth. It's just, you know, when he explained it to me, I just, 
I'd seen the pictures from the past, 1997 or something, when the entire area had flooded previously. Just a piece of you know trivia about where we live and how many how many people really do get affected by these disasters. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's why we need to build more of it. So um, thank you for laying the foundation for that. <laughs> um, okay, well, our last development report from. <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to move on to the housing programs report. And my first report. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> excited by a little bit yeah, of my stuff. I like it. <laughs> okay. So, um, the HCV updates um, we spent $4.9 million for a half uh, payment for the month of November. Um, 9,000 and half payment for mainstream, uh, 557,000 for the EHV program. Uh, for we had a little increase in our termination, uh, for the for the program, but it, it had a little bit of a mixture of, um, we had people with non compliance passed away. Um, zero half, or uh, we had one tenant that requested to be uh, removed from the program. Um, our annual certifications. Um, and zero half, just and for the zero. Is that right, this, is the, this is for people who like no longer they have such income that they no longer right. need it. So now they're paying, yeah, paying right on their own, so they don't need any subsidy. Okay. Um, so we continue with our um, annual recertifications. Uh, we had 348 um, interim certifications to 201. Um, FSS enrollment, we have seven new families. We had uh, 19 requests for tenancy approvals um, that were pending. In November, we had 290 voucher um holders that were searching all except the ehb uh for each ehb the uh for each we had 95 searching um there were 91 hqs inspections 81 of those were uh reported to to pick uh no during november there were also um 10 units work uh with zero hats and there was none that were under abatement. For the project base, we have a total of 685 units leased. And for the HCV program, we have 330 applicants in the waiting list, 704 were renamed, 260 were housed, 594 are in the process uh, through the eligibility. And we continue to mail out packets on a weekly basis. We leased uh, or we issued vouchers 200 in November or 276 and leased up 144. They buried the lead. <laughs> That's great. And uh, for the EHV, um, in November, we had 261 leads with 14 pending, uh, and we have 94 that are searching. For the foster youth, uh, we have four referrals, and three have been leased. We continue working with the community human services and housing resource centers so that they can send the, the results to us. Um, FSS program. We have 99 participants and 38 families who are escrowing. What do you mean by escrowing? Uh, that they, they're ending uh, their, their contracts and getting their money, correct? Yeah, you want to just talk about this quickly, like kind of how the FSS program works a little bit, just for folks that are familiar. Like me. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of a lot of jargon. <laughs> <laughs> in very unusual ways. I'm like, oh, they're an escrow. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Keeping it fun. 
<laughs> I should have brought the, my, um, we all uh, have the, the flyers. I can kind of go down the um, the bullet uh, points. Uh, so the, the FSS program is the family self-sufficient. We had, this is for our families who are participating in the HCB uh, program. They enter into a five-year contract uh, and they set some goals that need to be uh, reached by the, their fifth year. Um, anytime there is an increase in their earned income, um, we have what we call an escrow account, where the, there's the difference of what their rent was to the increase, whatever the, um, the difference is, had put that money into that account and on a monthly basis, it's earning interest. So the more earning in, um, income that they receive, the more money that they start getting into the, that account. Mm -hmm. After that five years, if they have accomplished all their goals and they're not receiving any kind of assistance, um, cash aid or um, food stamp, the, um, then they, they receive this money. And it's tax-free. We're hoping they use it or um, buy, to buy their first home, but it's you know on, on their decision. So now with that, with this program, first time home buyers, that hopefully we have more families who are interested with the, with the program. Oh, thank you, no problem. Did I miss anything? Just now, though. That is a cool program. Um, yeah, you gotta get those families in when the baseline is low. Like if they come in unemployed, right? That's when you get really, the money. Right. Yes. And we are uh, just to kind of add on. We almost finished with our application to become a um, housing counseling agency, mm -hmm. which will let us get housing counseling grants and get new staff people. So as they come out FSS, they go to the housing counseling person to help them find somewhere to stay. Mm -hmm. So we are on Myra and Gab is working with Hood on that. So we are about to finalize that application. And two little things. The waiting list, it should be exhausted soon. So probably in February, maybe it's March, somewhere in there, we'll be opening a new one, and then that would be the lottery. And uh, Hans, you know, I went and looked up how they actually figure out all the success rate. Uh -huh. I got it. It is 76% because it's unrealistic because we underutilized, but this is the way how they do it. You take the vouchers that you gave out for that month, how many least up in the first 30 to 60 days, especially the first 30 days, and take that percentage and then do it for every month for the year and see what that ends up being. So when you do it like that, because we actually lease up a lot of people in the first 30 days, most of them get lost at 61 days. So that's why the success rate is higher, even though we underutilize and that's what let us use those exemption payment standards. Okay, so you're telling me that of everybody that's issued a voucher, 76% mm -hmm. of those folks are able to lease up. In, in the first state. 60 days. So it could be potentially even higher than that. Because mm -hmm. uh, most of all our people, they do normally in the first 60 days, they lease up. We don't start losing them until after that 61st day. So even though our utilization is down overall with the number that we do every month, we have a good turnaround or we have been having a, a good turnaround. I mean, that's great. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's pretty high relative to other. I think other it's about us, all the stuff we've been doing lately. Because at the beginning of the year, in the end of last year, it was like 55. So I think it's because we got them, the workers, you know, calling them, hey, do you need help? Where are you going to stay? All that kind of and stuff. And this is over the past, like, 12 months? Mm -hmm. Wow. So 55 to 76. 76. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Think about that. Yeah. It's, it's good, but, you know, we still underutilized because we got about uh, another 900, but we made so much progress. That's amazing. Well, the other thing I was looking at on here was if you look on page 77 of the PDF, um, the number on the page says 75, but on the actual PDF, it's page 77, the chart, that one. Mm -hmm. At the top, when you look to the entire HCV program, uh, you know, we went from 33,350 units leased to 3,750. It's like uh, last month, we were up 300 families, 
and now we're up 400 families, which is crazy, right? Because it's we're still the same housing authority, but now all of a sudden there's 400 additional families that we're helping in a super meaningful way. Um, and I ran it as of today. Yeah. And we have actually housed 746 families this year. Yeah. The attrition rate for, you know, bad data and the people who fell off, that's what makes it a little lower, but actually leased out and housed. Yeah. I think it was 746. Yeah. I mean, it's it's great. And one of the questions that I'm going to have, not for right now, is just to start to think about with our budget authority, like what can that number get to before we start to run into I think we got enough room for another at least 900. Wow. Wow. Because of the uh, set aside money. So. Yeah. I know that in Gilroy, which has a, where I live, we have 60,000 population and, and they go count, right? And I think we, we have about seven, 800, quote, permanent homeless. Mm -hmm. So here, what's the population of Selena? It's probably a quarter of a million. Mm -hmm. Around so million. that's probably like four times. You might have four or 5,000 permanent homeless. If it's the same rate as ours, I don't know. Yeah, and again, uh, just you know, going from nineteen leased units in February of twenty twenty three to one hundred and forty four. I mean, this is double what we've kind of ever done before, um, which is again, I think it's huge, right? It just comes down to people and and. Uh, the thing that's crazy is leadership, right? Because it's a lot of the exact same folks in the same in this doing the same stuff, right? Just doing it differently. So um yeah, I think hats off to you guys. Um you doing a great job and keep it up. So am I correct in understanding that this year too we have an increase in our voucher amount? That was a a pretty significant change that has been impacting this program over the last year, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Over the past year, for sure, that could have contributed to the success rate. Indeed, and well, not to poo-poo it, I'm just saying. No, like, absolutely. You know, to, of to course. Know that was something that the community yeah. um, has been saying for a long time is we have to get the amount of this voucher up that to me. Well, and, the payment standards went up, but I think really, even, I don't think the money is what made it be successful. When I first got here, people just were not coming to get the vouchers. We would uh, have briefings and nobody would show up. They were turning them down. And I couldn't ever figure out, like, why are they doing this? Why they won't come get it? So we did so much outreach and getting the landlord symposium, kind of educating everybody, and then having those big voucher events. So we put that awareness back out there and it made people trust the agency and realize, like, they really are going to get it and I really can't use it. And that's when it really started to pick up because they would have briefings and it wouldn't be, you know, like two people in here or something. Yeah. Wait until it goes to help us with the process for it to be quicker to get the, yeah. the voucher before it was one letter after another letter after another appointment before the family came in and gave them the voucher. And their snail mail letters. Yes. <laughs> so now with the special uh, events that we had, that really helped yeah. us out a lot. That's great. Well, yeah, I, again, I just from a distance here, I just appreciate the creativity, you know, things like that and the energy. So, um, the proof I think in the pudding. Any comments or questions on the housing programs this morning? Okay. Well, then we are going to um, move on to item nine, which is a closed session item. Um, the board of commissioners going to convene a closed session um related to government code section 54956.9 subsection b subsection b um relating to um certain matters related to litigation involving housing all right uh the board commissioners met in closed session and there's nothing to report out we are going to move on to item 10 commissioner comments um, and we are going to start with Commissioner Anderson. Uh, I just wanted to apologize again for my tardiness. I failed to look closely at my calendar. Otherwise, uh, no one comments. No problem. Um, and Commissioner uh, Goodwin. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to wish everybody um, safe and happy holidays. Um, and, um, and thank everybody for the report. And 
if my memory serves me correctly, I believe Zalise has been with us for a year now. And I just wanted to congratulate her on a fantastic year. And um, if this is a sample of um, what she is capable of doing, the future looks bright. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Healy. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Zalika and thank you to James and thank you to Mike and Kim and thank you to Jose and thank you to Diana and uh, and a special thank you to Carolina and want to wish her the best of luck in her new endeavors and Carolina I'll be looking forward to seeing you around town. Happy holidays to everyone. Thank you. Thank you Commissioner Healy and Commissioner Ballester. Okay I wrote some things down here. Carolina, I just want to wish you the best in your future endeavors. It's a, it's been a pleasure working alongside with you. And I will stop by if he's okay. I'm just going to drop <laughs> off a little gift for her and uh, Nora uh, for Christmas, just to tell them I appreciate them. And um, I also want to say kudos what Kevin had mentioned, you know, for the uh, for Old Delmar and getting that um, resolution done. And um, the last thing I want to say, when I went, huh, I attended a holiday event. It was um, hosted by Supervisor Luis Alejo. And <clears throat> they had invited me, they invited me by phone call, they invited me by email. So to me, it was an obligation that I needed to be there because I was representing this district. So I made sure that I went I didn't know that I was going to be given a recognition, you know, from him, from the Board of Supervisors. So um, when I went and talked to him, I tapped him on the shoulder. He was, you know, there was a lot of people around and he was so happy to see me. And he mentioned Zulika when he talked to me. And he told me that he feels that Zulika is doing a fabulous job with the agency and leading. And he sees a future, you know, bright for this community. So, Salika, thank you. And he said that he knew when he interviewed you that you were the right candidate. So I just want to pass that on. That came from him. That didn't come from me. And I just want to share that in front of your staff. And thank you for all that you do because you're making um, this community and helping those that um, need housing your your you and your staff are fulfilling that for those you know the families the children and they're able to have a roof over their heads so thank you and i want to wish everybody a merry christmas and a happy new year i'm just going to say that uh i want to wish you the best as well uh, really 22 years. I mean, it's, it's kind of incredible. Um, I was telling her um, I was 15 years old when she joined the housing store. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, so yes, it's been a good run. I remember run. you were 15. Yep. And so, um, so yeah, and then, you know, I just continue to be impressed by the, the changes in the Section 8 department. Obviously, that's a big part of what we do. And you know, again, I just come back to that number. There's 400 families in the county now that have serious rental assistance that had nothing before. Uh, and there's a path to maybe helping another 900, right? That's 1,300 families. Um, you know, and I think that's, you can see how just getting the right people and the right leadership and getting everybody to row in the same direction and you know, the staff stepping up, I think it makes a huge difference. So um, yeah, Merry Christmas and happy holidays to everyone. And um, yeah, we'll adjourn the HACA meeting here at 715. And we're gonna move over to the HDC meeting and I will hand it over to Chair Goodwin. Okay, it is um, 715, um, Monday, December 18th. Uh, and um, Rika, I believe you'll do roll call. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Chair Francine Goodwin. Present. Vice Chair Yuri Anderson. Here. Director Kathleen Belisaro. Present. Director Hans Buder. Present. 
Director Maria Orozco is absent. Director Kevin Healy. Present. That concludes the roll call vote. Um, comments from the public, if there is any, on the line or in person? There's no one in the building. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, consent agenda. Uh, agenda uh, are considered to um, routine and they are not required to sep um, require separate discussion. Um, do I need to read all that? No, ma'am, you don't have to. Okay, I mean, I will if, you, if I'm supposed to. But anyway, um, the cons there's a consent agenda on next. Uh, do we have one on agenda to? I move approval of the consent agenda. And I second. Sorry. Thank you. All right, we'll vote. Uh, Chair Francine Goodwin? Yes. Vice Chair Yuri Anderson? Yes. Director Kathleen Bellastaro? Yes. Director Hans Buder? Yes. Director Kevin Healy? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, next, um, let's see. Oh, the, uh, okay, the, oh, that was the approval of the HGC minutes just now, right? That we just did? Yes, ma'am. Okay, sorry, for November 27th. Okay, I apologize. Okay, um, uh, item number five, information, uh, property minutes, Property management report. Uh, we did the report uh, at the previous half of meeting, and there's nothing additional to the report. Okay. Um, I have a quick um note that I wanted to ask you real quick. Um, the um, you kind of skimmed over anything to do with Casanova Plaza. Uh, and uh, there were people that were listening in. And um, and I was wondering if um, you can kind of just sh maybe share with me real quick what you sh um, sh uh, what share with the um, the board what you shared with me today uh, regarding the uh, the uh, cameras and the alarm system just real quick if if that's possible because it yeah. wasn't really mentioned in in the last meeting. Yes, uh, uh, the alarm uh, we should be um, back online with the alarm before the end of this week. And the cameras, we will be replacing the cameras are in place and adding additional cameras at some locations uh, in common areas to track any activity uh, that can be, uh, you know, track in common areas uh, due to the alarm, uh, people pulling the uh, fire alarm. So we are going to be installing those uh, this month, before the end of this month. We're also gonna look at the side gate, that is uh, the parking gate that is uh, right now non-operational that we need to operate and uh, making sure that the systems at the front door are operational as well to make sure that the building is secure. So those will be uh, things that we will be doing uh, before the end of this month, director. Okay, so those will be the priorities? Correct. Correct, okay, thank you so much, Jose. Appreciate it. Okay, um, development report, we already did that, I think. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, all right. So um, we will move on to item six, director comments. Um, let's see, Commissioner um, Booter, why don't we start with you? No additional comments. Okay. Um, okay. Commissioner um, Anderson? No additional comments. Okay. Uh, uh, Kathleen? Director Kathleen. Yes, Merry Christmas to all the staff. Thank you. Um, and um, Director Healy. Uh, I would just add Gabby to my list of gratitude from the previous meeting. So Gabby, thank you for all of your good work <laughs> and happy holidays. <laughs> and, okay. And I already did. Did I skip anybody? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, all right. Um. Okay. I think that would be it. And I think um we're ready to say Merry Christmas and do a happy adjournment. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> seven twenty one.
<laughs> Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. Bye, Bye, thank you guys. Thank you.